This podcast is brought to you by Blackbee Ministries International. To find out more, visit blackbee.org. Welcome to the Richard Blackaby Leadership Podcast. My name is Sam and I'm your host. And today on the podcast, we have a very special guest. Horace Schultze is the founder, chairman, and CEO of the Capella Hotel Group and co-founder and former COO of Ritz-Carlton Hotel Company. He is a legendary leader and global titan of business. His visionary and disruptive principles have reshaped the concepts of excellence, service, and competitive advantage, transcending divisions of industry across the business landscape. His book, Excellence Wins, is out now, and we'll leave links to that in the show notes. For time, we've decided to make this a two-part episode. So now, please enjoy part one of our conversation with Horst Schultze. Well, I'm really excited today to have a very special guest. Uh, We're privileged, uh, and I'm privileged, to be able to work with uh, some outstanding CEOs uh, that lead uh, all kinds of very well-known companies around America and the world. And uh, today's guest is uh, I, just a very special person. It's uh, Horst Schultze, uh, best known, I suppose, for um, founding and building the Ritz-Carlton hotel chains. And, uh, uh, and uh, anyone that has ever stayed at Ritz-Carlton knows it's something special. And, uh, and so uh, Horst has had a fascinating journey uh, and career, highly respected in the industry and as a business leader. And so, Horace, welcome to the uh, to the podcast today. Well, Richard, delighted to be with you. Thank you for having me. Uh, tell us a little bit about your journey, because you people can tell by your accent that you probably weren't born in the deep south of America somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> not exactly. Uh, not not in Germany. Not even southern Germany. <laughs> and, and, and anyway, well, I. I I was born and grew up as a small child in a small village in Germany uh, after the war. And I was born 39. Oh, so really? uh, 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 just in the beginning of the war. In fact, my, my father left right after I was born. And the next time I saw him or he me is when I was nearly seven. Wow. Interesting enough. Yes. So wow. that's another story, though. Mm. Uh, so uh, in, in at that time after the war, you didn't. Do things like going to hotel business that was kind of very low nothing you particularly in germany the technical jobs i if, if i would have a hand what they call hand job hand work if i would have said i want to be a roofer that would have been okay mm. it would have said a, a, a carpenter anything but or, or maybe if i would have said engineer now that would have been very special mm. and i said with 11 i want to be in hotel business now, how would, you my, know, how would you know that at age 11? I don't know. Nobody <laughs> knows why. I must have, because I'd never been in a hotel in my life. Never mm. seen a hotel. There is no hotel in my village. There wasn't even a restaurant. Mm. It's never been in a restaurant. I must have read something. I don't know. Mm. And my, my parents tried to figure out later, and we couldn't. But I, they said in the beginning, said, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, I kept on insisting on it. They started to get embarrassed in the village. That's literally. And, uh, but they saw my persistence. They inquired about it. They learned the best way to start a career would be to start in the finest hotel possible. Hmm. They found a job 100 kilometers away as a busboy in a hotel. Hmm. Now, 100 kilometers at the time was far hmm. so with 14 i left home wow. my parents took me to this hotel I lived in a dorm room upstairs and uh, in typical german fashion in that business then you go once a week to a school of that profession hmm. and so once a week i worked there from early morning to late in the evening once a week went to hotel school from all the kids around the region but when I arrived, and that was life-changing for me, and my parents had said, no, this is the finest hotel in the region. This is a hotel for only fine ladies and gentlemen. Hmm. We could never go there. And you have to understand that, behave yourself and so on. When I arrived there, the general manager told me the same thing. You're the servants. Our guests are very important fine ladies and gentlemen. Hmm. That was the... The thing, but the maitre d, who was in charge of all the restaurants, the kitchens, and so on, welcomed us. And he, what he said was, now tomorrow morning, 
you come to work here. But I don't really want you to work. I want you to try and accomplish excellence in what you're doing. Hmm. Now that went right over my head with 14. <laughs> excellence in washing dishes, cleaning floors. Hmm. No. Well, it went on and he kept on. He was, he was a human being of excellence. Hmm. He would have, for example, he would have never entered the restaurant without looking absolutely perfect. Hmm. Uh, he was a human being of excellence and teaching us. And he kept on talking about excellence. Mm. In fact, he used the English word excellence. Mm. He spoke all kinds of languages. The, he passed you in the, in, during the morning and said, now remember, excellence. Mm. So it was a word after a while. But after two years going to that hotel school once a week, the teacher asked us, write three pages about what you now think about the hotel business. Going back to work that night, I was cleaning a table in the corner. I could feel the maitre d' had entered the room. I mean, I mean it, literally. You could feel when he came in. Oh, he was an unusual human being. Hmm. But I saw him approach the table, and it hit me for the first time. I could feel it, but it never hit me clearly. The people on that table was proud that he came to them. Hmm. I said, wait a minute, that's a reversal. We are the servants, they're the important ladies and gentlemen. And I gave that thought, and that night I started writing my essay, and I named that essay, We Are Ladies and Gentlemen, Serving Ladies and Gentlemen. Hmm. That means if we define ourselves and create excellence, there came the word, in what we are doing, then we define ourselves as ladies and gentlemen. So with other words, no matter what in life I'm doing, I can define myself as somebody in special. And I wrote that in an essay, we are ladies and gentlemen, and I've made it very clear. If it's not excellent, then we are servants. Huh. We, are, we are now sentence ourselves to servants or defining ourselves as ladies and gentlemen. Now, I turned over my essay, the next, uh, the following week, when I came back to the class, there was the classroom was packed with people, every teacher from the school and people, every people, uh, what's going on here? And the teacher said, I'm going to read you something. And he was reading my essay. Wow. And I got an A. Huh. So it, it impacted me, it, particularly since, no kidding, it was the only A I ever had. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't think I had one since. You know, so. <laughs> so it impacted me. I went on and finished my work there. Went from there to work in Switzerland in two places. Worked in the Holland America line. I worked uh, done in France for a couple of years. Worked in England and us in the... Because you were in, in several the, of the top uh, hotels in Europe, weren't you? Are absolutely the finest hotels in Europe. I can tell you unequivocally the finest that existed. Hmm. And and I worked in this in the, as a waiter in the meantime in the Savoy in London. When a guest said to me, "Do you want to work in in America?" Oh yeah, sure. If he would have said Zambia, I would have said yes, sure too. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't that I want to come to the land of the free and the brave. I said okay. And he said, I sent you some paper, I go to the embassy. He sent me paper, I went to the embassy, and I got my, my green card. And so I became a legal immigrant to the United States, hmm. legal. Hmm. And, and in fact, I ran into my green card from 50 years ago. And so I arrived here, started working for, for with Hilton, worked for Hyatt, and then in, in, in all kinds of places. And then I, somebody, in the meantime, I was a vice president hired, responsible for the United States food and beverage operations, all operations for Hyatt. When somebody called me and said, we're starting a new hotel company in Atlanta. We have two hotels in construction. We want to create a new brand. We need somebody to operate the company. I had no interest but they kept on talking to me. Sherry, my wife, prayed on it very heavy. I prayed on it too, not quite as heavy as she did. 
And we prayed that one door would close and one door would open. Hmm. I said all the time, I'm not interested. But you could feel because I said, if I would take that job, I would only take it to create create the finest hotel company in the world. Hmm. So I was dreaming. Hmm. And hmm. she could see there was an interest. Hmm. And, uh, and so we prayed and all of a sudden I went to work and I told them, they called me again and I said, no, I will not come to Atlanta. Thank you very much. Please do not call me again. <laughs> we to, please do not call me again. It's over. Hmm. I went to work the next door and something ethically happened with the person I reported to that really disturbed me. And I thought, went home and say, how can I keep on reporting to him when they called me again? Hmm. And I accepted the job. Hmm. And uh, with tears, I left a great company. With tears in my eyes, I moved to Atlanta. And that was, was August 1982. 80, 80, I moved to Atlanta beginning of January 83 and a year later we opened our first hotel hmm. in the meantime we purchased a, a hotel a dilapidated hotel in Boston we closed it for renovation because it was totally dilapidated and but it had a name that we adopted because it was registered around the world and the name was Ritz Carlton hmm. but the first hotel we opened was the Ritz Carlton and Bucket. If you like what we're doing and would like to support our work, please consider making a donation. Even a little bit will go a long way toward keeping this podcast going for the months and years to come. To support this podcast, click on the link in the show notes. We are truly grateful for our wonderful community of listeners. Yeah, and I, you know, and, I didn't know that till I got to know mm-hmm. you. That uh, you always assume that a hotel chain is going to open in uh, New York City or Chicago, yeah. maybe, but but uh, North uh, yeah. Atlanta is the, where Ritz Carlton yeah. began. Yeah, so. yeah. And, and and it was a was an, it was an interesting thing going into the, and of course I insisted that I, we would go high market, top market. Otherwise, I wouldn't take the job. We, we did. We renovated the hotel. Mind you. The, the interesting thing, our first hotel, the Ritz Carlton Bucket, was actually built as a Holiday Inn. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. But it, so by the time I joined, and then we decided to go high end. We got we 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 done read redid read the interior design, and it was our first hotel. The second hotel, by the way, was downtown Atlanta. Huh. <laughs> not strat- not strategically very smart, but huh. it worked. Huh. So from there on, we grew. We grew and with a with a with a vision and purpose for the company, purpose for the company, mind you, was to become the leader in service industry in the world. Hmm. That was the whole that was everybody I hired from the very beginning and said, Do you want to join my dream? Hmm. Do you want to join my dream to become the finest service organization in the world? Hmm. People laughed about it because we didn't even have a hotel, mind you. <laughs> so but that was the dream and that was and we became driven by that purpose that, you know, uh, I, I, but I question myself with that purpose, seriously question myself, is this purpose and that's leadership good for all concerned? Hmm. What I'm dreaming here, is it good for me? Is it good for the company, for the investors? Is it good for the guests that hmm. we will serve? Is it good for the employees? Hmm. Is it good for society? And I really agonized and saw and sought the answer on that. Hmm. And once, once the answer was clear, I said, would God approve? Hmm. And that, that was a clear answer to me. Hmm. So after that, I knew exactly what to do because the vision was clear. Hmm. Because, because the, the vision and, the, and, and I knew it was good for everybody. I now could not compromise what I do anymore. I had to make all decisions to serve that because that's when I was serving all. Well, you know, Horace, you, I mean, Ritz Carlton, anyone who stayed at one <laughs> knows uh, how well they're run and, and managed. But, uh, uh, but, you know, I think there's lots of people that would say, well, we want to do things with excellence now. That's kind of a, a catch word, but, but then you, you do business with them and you realize, well, they, they, they're not doing things with that. They, they say that they, they use the word. But you, you did some very specific things 
that Ritz Carlton has made famous, really, in terms of uh, how to treat guests and so on, and how to treat staff. And uh, we do have. Uh, I wish we had all day to talk about that because that's I've, I've read many leadership books that will cite Ritz Carlton as just a, an example of excellence. But what are give us a couple of examples that some things you implemented into Ritz Carlton that made it such an excellent experience for people. Well, well let, let me let me say something about the success of Ritz Carlton for a moment. We have to understand that we didn't own the hotels. Each hotel was owned by somebody else and consequently a separate business unit, which I had to put together. And, and mind you, we were in five continents and every one of our hotels where we had our name on, where we had the right to run it the way we want to, became the leader in the market segment in five continents. Hmm. So, the, so the philosophy works, hmm. period. It cannot be argued. Hmm. And, and the f- philosophy was very simply understand what the customer wants really on don't, don't don't not your opinion but real studies of your market segment what they want then make sure that every one of your employees understands that is what the customer wants mm. and then manage this with strategies and processes and systems and control to deliver it but at the same time, create an environment where the employees want to do it. Mm. And that is, so to create the processes, that's management. To create the environment where the employees want, want to do it is leadership. Mm. So that's how, how we talk it. So, so in order that that worked, we, that we had the employees understand that we made sure we had a selection process, unique selection for each job category about 30 job categories in a hotel. Then we made sure we had a unique orientation where we aligned, truly aligned the employee behind the expectation of the customers and the philosophy of the organization. When we hired people, we said, we are not hiring for you to become a front office clerk or a maid or a cook. We want you to join us, our dream, because to cook is just a function. I'm not hiring for function. I'm hiring you to be part of a something. Hmm. And of course, then, once you accept this dream that we have to be the finest in the world, your function has to be fulfilled better than the competitor that does it. Hmm. Otherwise, we will never be the best in the world. Mm. But do not join us for work. Join us for a dream, for a purpose. Mm. I, I, at the same time, we aligned the employees' motives in life with the purpose that we had. For example, we want to be the finest in the world. That means we will grow and you will have opportunities. That means we will have the finest guests. That means we have better income. That means you will be respected because we will be honored as being the finest. That means you will be respected, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So, so with other words, we, we, we aligned everybody. Everybody, uh, Richard, every company today talks about alignment, and they don't even know what it means. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, yeah. it's so sad. Yeah. And finally, we said, it is everybody's number one objective in this company Everyone, the dishwasher or the general manager or the vice president is to convince the guest to want to come back to us in what we are doing. Mm. That, that's everyone. Mm. So with other words, you're not checking them in. While you're checking them, you convince them by what you do to want to come back. Mm. Make sure the guests are loyal. So the philosophy was loyal guests. You know, mm. Richard, a great company or great organization the number one objective should be to keep the ones that are already participating. Huh. Make uh, them loyal. You know, number you, two, find. Oh, go ahead. Yeah? Well, I was going to say, two, you're, you, find I, new ones, yeah. I know that you, uh, you had s- several things. Like, for instance, you would measure how many co- points of contact a guest had when they got out of their car yeah. before, by the yeah. time they got to their room. Yeah. And how many... Yeah. We, we, which is which, which was, it's absolutely fascinating. But there, there again... 
what do people what what we, we have to understand it's not it's the contact but has what has to happen during this contact mm -hmm. what has to happen every time every time you have to say we respect you for example working with behavioral analysts we learned i learned that anybody if i meet you i will make a decision about you and you about me when we come within nine to ten feet of each other hmm. what if we know it or not we make a subconscious decision well now that i know that i want to be sure you make it this subconscious positive decision hmm. every time you pass anybody so that, so we taught that whenever anybody comes within nine feet of you, you look him in the eye and say, welcome, good morning, how are you today? Or good afternoon or whatever. Hmm. Don't say hi. <laughs> because if I say hi, I'm saying you are equal. I'm equal with you. Hi. But if I'm going to say good morning, sir, good morning, man, or whatever. Good morning, sir, how are you? I'm saying I'm respecting you. Ah, but at the same time, I'm saying, I'm professional. You can trust me. Hmm. So we looked at that. We made sure we taught all that. The first day people came to work, the first time we aligned them behind those expectations of the customers, every employee. So if that welcome, that fine greeting happens to you in a positive way, several times as you check in, several times during the year, during, the, during your stay, you will be in a positive mood about us. Hmm. You want, and if you leave, and if I say, how did you like your stay? And you would answer, I like the furniture, or I like the food. We failed. <laughs> it had to be all, you shouldn't know why, you should just feel good. Hmm. And, yeah. and any company can apply this to their market segment, no matter what business you're in. Yeah, and which is what horses. And by the way, it's I, you also had a fascinating uh, uh, rule that any staff person could spend up to two thousand yeah, dollars yeah. without it without <laughs> approval to make sure a customer stayed happy. That's, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's why amazing. Why do I laugh about it? Why do I laugh about it? Because I, it comes up all the time. But I laugh about it because immediately I'm transferred back in my mind to that moment when I announced it. <laughs> when I announced on a company, it was like nuclear bombs went off. <laughs> and, and you mind you, as I told you before, all hotels are owned by different people. And the owners came to me, are you insane? <laughs> you want busboys to give away $2,000? You must be, and we're going to sue you for mismanagement. <laughs> and, it was, and, and I said, no, I don't want us to give $2,000 away. I want the bus boy to make sure the customer doesn't leave us, becomes loyal. And, and imagine, imagine you, you, the, the hotel guest. No, let's, let's stay first. There are three types of customers. They're the dissatisfied ones who become terrorists against your organization. Hmm. Hmm. And then they're the satisfied. The satisfied go next door if there's a better offer. Hmm. And that there's the loyal one. They're loyal to you. Why are they loyal? Loyalty is nothing more than trust. They trust you mm. and trust what you're doing. That's why they come to you. Mm. So now, knowing that, I have to, you are the guest, and you, you had a bad experience with your room. The TV didn't work, the toilet didn't flush, and you come down in the morning and the bus boy says, good morning, sir. I hope you had a nice day with us. That really annoys you. You will say, no, I did not. In fact, I'm very unhappy. Now think about the bus boy saying, sir, forgive me about your TV. I'm so sorry. Forgive me about to me. I'm so sorry. In fact, I feel so bad. Allow me to buy your breakfast. Bang. You move from being a terrorist to being an ambassador. Yeah. yeah. And that is worse to me something. A lot of money. Yeah. No. Yeah. It, it, it people didn't spend two thousand dollars like that. One time, an incident happened, which I applauded. I didn't agree with it, but I applauded. I had to applaud because I came up with the idea. <laughs> two thousand dollars. But but usually, usually they bought a drink, cookies, breakfast, a, a, a fruit basket, mm -hmm. and said, "Forgive me," because what I also knew from behavioral science was that 96% of all dissatisfaction 
The person she's satisfied only wants to get rid of their frustration. They don't want anything. They want to stand somebody to say, I'm sorry. Hmm. Not, not I called the manager, hmm. but saying, forgive me. In that moment, they're rid of their frustration. But when, 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 when employees said, well, <clears throat> I called the manager, or worse, they always do it. Hmm. But that, that ma makes it even worse. Yeah. Yeah. The frustration is even worse. Well, I remember uh, being at Ritz Carlton and my internet wasn't working the first night I checked in, and uh, I I went down to the lobby because I had to send off an email uh, before uh, I went to bed. And the next day, the manager uh, was talking to me and asked how things went, and I just said, uh, you know, told them the internet hadn't worked, but uh, otherwise the room was fine. Uh, and they'd actually sent someone up to fix it, but they couldn't fix it that night, and finally just gave up trying and the manager was appalled he said uh that that technician should have either fixed it or moved you to another room and should never have left you overnight without sure. internet and of so course. he said uh, can i make it up to you i can we move you to a different room i said okay i guess so he said well listen we'll we'll send up a team to move everything you don't need to do that and just be ready so i we were well they put us up to the penthouse we were up at the very top floor had three i think three bathrooms in our one room i <laughs> i had to text my wife to find out where she was in the in the room it was so big looking out on the ocean yeah. and i i tell you what at, at that point i was a loyal ritz carlton uh guest uh that they had gone to such extremes uh just to D take care of are. us there you are you 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 know realize they care about me yeah. and you, this is somebody i can trust that's a subconscious thing and so you become a loyal customer thanks for listening to the podcast if this is something you enjoyed it really makes a difference if you leave a review and a five-star rating on apple podcasts or wherever you listen don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends we always love hearing from our listeners so email us at podcast at blackv.org